what you mean, God. Jesus is all the world to me. Oh, my life, my joy. From day to day, from day to day, oh, without him I are with all. When I am blessed, when I am sad, to him I love. No other one can cheer me so. Good afternoon. Will you just touch the hand of the person next to you as we look to the Lord on this great and auspicious occasion to th thank God for this blessing. Father God, we come today to say thank you. We thank you for 94 years of ministry and fellowship. And now today as you have favored this church, we thank you for the great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before. We come today to thank you for the shoulders that we stand on 94 years later. We thank you since 1925, you have favored this ministry, this group of called out and baptized believers. And now today, Lord, we ask that your continued favor rest on the shepherd of this season. We thank you for Dr. Pruitt. We thank you for his vision and for his leadership. And so we ask today on this mortgage burning ceremony that you be glorified, for you are the source that made it possible. And so we thank you for being Jehovah Jireh. We thank you for providing. This we ask in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen.
Hebrews. What you see up there is the King James Version, tremendous translation of the text. But I'm going to read from one of the modern versions, amen, the English Standard Version. It reads a little different because the Greek text of the King James Version is a little different than the Greek text of the ESV, amen. That's the first reason there's a little de difference. But then the, the, the King James was written in Victorian English, amen. And uh, this is written in a more modern flow. But the sense is the same. Would you please stand as I read into your hearing this text, those who are healthy enough to stand. Before I read the text, I want to whisper a word of prayer. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Oh God, we pause before we preach ask for your divine help. No man is sufficient to preach without the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I am, we are dependent upon you. Help me to proclaim, to make clear, to manifest Christ, the truths of Christ. And Holy Spirit, do your work to convince the hearer that it is true. In the name of Jesus, we bless you. Amen. Beginning at verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Un underline that. Put a, put a tag on that. We feel confident of better things. Amen. We, we, here's another way to translate it. We hope for better things. Hold on. Here it is. We are assured of better things. things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Look at verse 11. And We desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience, you, are you all watching this? Inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. <laughs> saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham having, look at this, patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves and in their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable, look at this, character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled from refuge might have strong encouragement, look at this, to hold fast to the hope, look at this, set before us. Do you see that? 
He says, I'm convinced of more to come. Then he talks about a hope that is yet before us. Are you with me? Verse 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You may be seated. The writer of Hebrews says in verse 9, we feel sure of better things. And then, then he says in verse 18 to hold fast to a hope that is set ahead of us. I want to talk for a few moments today. The best is yet to come. We are, we are grateful for these 94 years. But God is not finished with Mount Enon yet. The best is yet to come. There is a hope laid before you. Amen. Don't think that because you finished paying off the mortgage that you can fold up your hands and go home. Don't, don't think that it's time to stop praying. It's time to stop giving. It's time to stop serving. Oh, no, because the Bible says that the best is yet in front of you. Can I get a witness right there that the best is yet to come? The pastor mentioned decline. And the church is declining all over the world. Not all over the world, but all over all over this nation. Amen. Yet the best is ahead of us. Amen. There, there, there never was a time when, when I grew up and I began pastoring. Even when I began pastoring Phillips Temple, the only sporting event on Sunday, amen, was the NBA and, and the NFL, and they had since to start at 1 o'clock. Come on, somebody. But now you got Little League, amen, on Sunday morning, amen. Every, everything encroaching upon the church, yet the best is yet to come. And that's, what, that's what's established in verses 9 through 20, amen. Now, I'm going to alleviate a whole lot of uh, preliminaries about the book of Hebrews and kind of jump right into the text, amen. The writer of the Hebrews, is, is this letter, is encouraging believers that are thinking about stopping. For one reason or another, they are, they are thinking about um, going back to the Jewish faith. Amen. Because of persecution, because of hardship, because of, of tribulation, amen. Um, they were saying to themselves that it was, it was better for us before we came to Jesus. So there, there, there are warnings and encouragement throughout the whole book. And what we see in verses 9 to 20 is one of the most encouraging passages ever that you'll see in the New Testament. And there are several reasons here, and I want to share with you one by one as we worked our way from verse 9 to verse 20 of how it is and why it is we have hope. 
And here's the first reason. The first reason we have hope, the first reason that the best is yet to come is this. The Bible tells us that God is in love with us. And therefore, the best is yet to come. I want to tell you something. Mount Enon, God has never stopped loving you, and he loves you with an everlasting love. His love ought to give you hope no matter what you face, and his love guarantees that you have a future, a brighter future than you've ever had in the past. How do we see it? Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says this, Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, underline that. He identifies the readers as beloved, the beloved of God. That means several things. One of the things it means is he is sure that they're saved. Amen, amen. They may not be sure, but he's sure. And he calls them the beloved, amen. He's, he's sure that they have a filial relationship with God. He, he's sure that that church is filled with sons and daughters of God, amen. And because they were loved by God, they had a future, and he's sure of it. Look, look at how he says it in verse 9. Though, though we speak in this way, yet in our case, beloved, we feel sure of better things to come. How do I know that the best is yet to come for you? God loves you. I'm sure of it. You ought to ask yourself, why, why is it that you've come this far? Why, why is it that you've been able to do what you've been able to do? It's, it's, not, it's not because of you, but it's because of his love for you. You started in 1925. The Roaring Twenties. Three years later, you were in you 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 were you were an infant in 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 the greatest economical downfall this country has ever known. Amen. You you made it through World War II. Amen. You you made it through Korea. Amen. You made it through Vietnam. You you made it through Jim Crow. Why is it? It's because God loved you. Amen. And if God loved you, then his love will usher you in to a future that you have not seen. Amen. Now, um, the text says, the text says we are persuaded. The King James says that word persuaded is a wonderful word in the, in the Greek. It, it, it's a word that means tranquilize. Come on, somebody. Paul, Paul, Paul the writer says we have... I'm, we have been we have been tranquilized by the love of God. Oh, come on, somebody! Every once in a while, we all need a tranquilizer. Amen, amen. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about the legal kind. Come on, somebody! I see how your minds was going. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. I've had a few surgeries. I thank God for tranquilizing. The doctor has cut on me and poked on me. Amen. But because he, he gave me a few tranquilizers, I was able to endure the pain. I was able to endure the process. I was able to go through it. Watch this, watch this, watch this. We have hope and we have a future because of what the love of God does in us and through us and on us. Amen. Don't, don't you know when you are convinced that God loves you, there's a whole lot of things you can endure. There, there are a whole lot of things you can carry when you're sure that God loves you. Let me show you something else in the text. The best is yet to come because you are people that are loved by God. But watch this. You, you are people that are saved. I thought I'd get amens on that. The salvation of God 
assures that the best is yet to come. He says in verse 9, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to what? Salvation. The writer is convinced that God is not finished with this church, with these believers, because of the fact that they were saved. Amen. Don't lose sight of the fact of the power of salvation. Salvation guarantees that what you're experiencing now is not the end. There's a world-famous preacher who wrote a book, How to Live Your Best Life Now. Some of y'all may have it. That can only be true if you are not a Christian. I'm going to let that sink into you, amen. If you're living your best life now, you are not saved. If you're living your best life now, you are not redeemed. If you're living your best right now, you have, no, you have no forgiveness. You have not been justified. You have not been called. You are not a part of God's elect. Amen. Because the Bible says if you have been saved, amen, there are things that will accompany salvation, amen, even into eternity. Our salvation. I'm not just saved for today. I'm saved for tomorrow. And I'm not just saved for today and tomorrow. I'm saved for eternity. Amen. One day we will live forever. Amen. In a place where there will be no more weeping, no more crying. In a place where there will be no more sorrow, no more. Yes. Y'all know what John says. In that eternal city, he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. Oh, yes. One of these old days, I'm going to put on my robe, amen, and God, God, our, our salvation, our salvation, our salvation, oh, to be saved, thank God that I'm saved, thank God that I'm blood bought and blood washed. Thank God I've been transferred out of darkness and brought into his light. Th thank God. Thank God he has brought me from death to life. He has taken me from the kingdom of darkness and placed me in the kingdom of his son. Thank, thank God he has justified me, made me as though I had just as never sinned. Thank, thank God for his atonement being at one with him. Thank, thank God. I have a mercy seat in Jesus. Thank God. Thank, thank God. I have been adopted. Thank, thank God. I have been glorified. Thank God. I have been sanctified. It, it guarantees. Guarantees my future. Amen. There are still people to be saved. That's why the best is yet to come. Amen. There's still some children that need to learn their Sunday school lesson. That's, that's, why, that's why the best is yet to come, amen. There's still lost people that need to be saved. That's why the best is ahead for the church. Amen. There's another reason why we have hope. Hope of a great future. Simply this, that we have not been forgotten by God. That's what he says in verse 10. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work. Hmm. Look, look, look. He's not unjust to overlook your work. The love that you've shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. You, 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 need, you need to live your life in verse 10. There, there are a whole lot of people that get discouraged because nobody remembers them on this side. 
Thank God for verse 10. Now, I'm glad this church, this church has, has not forgotten those who have gone on. I, I see, I, I, I see you got your homebound members here and friends. Thank God you remembered. I was reading somewhere, I saw, I saw some people in red right here, past, past members who have contributed and, and passed on. You haven't forgotten Deacon Clemmy, Harry Hines, and Trustee John Rogers, and Trustee Thomas Vance, and Trustee Major L. Nimick, and Annie Stewart, and Lizzie Simpkins, and Brother Eddie D. Dudley, and Deacon Tom Davis, Deacon Forrest Jones, Sister Anna Watley and Ora Brookshire and Sister Annie Marsh and Deacon William Hurley and Deacon Nathaniel Hicks and Deacon Otis Long, Deacon Howard Long and Sister Alva Cunningham and Sister Dorothy Bobo. I'm glad you haven't remembered. Hey, you, you haven't forgotten them. But just in case you do, God won't. If your, never, if your name never gets in a program, don't worry about it, amen. Amen. If your name, name is never called, you keep on serving God. You, you keep on working for God. You keep on loving God. You keep praying for this church. You keep tithing. You keep serving. You keep witnessing, amen. It doesn't matter. Men might forget you, but God won't forget you. And, and over yonder, your name will. Yes, he will. There's a name, amen. There's a name right now that nobody knows, amen. If the devil knew it, he would use it against you, amen. But when you get over there, when you get over there, God, God says, I know your labor. Isn't that what he says in verse 10? I know your labor. I know your love for the saints. I know what you're doing. Look at how verse 10 ends and what still doing. You know why you still need to do it? You still need to do it because the best is yet to come. Because God won't forget you. I want you to do this. Number one, be sincere. Amen. Amen. You might never get to ever stand behind the podium. Guess what? Be sincere anyway. It's right there in verse 11. Verse 11 says it. Look, and we desire each one of you to show the same what? Earnestness. Be real. Be sincere. This church needs to be filled from this pew all the way to the end, two times a day. Amen with people that are sincere and earnest. Why? Because God's watching. He's not going to forget you. Be sincere. Be willing to serve and keep serving. Verse 10 ends, but how, with verse 10 ends by saying what and what? Still do it. Verse 12 says that guess what? We need to be filled with people that are going to w willing to work through things. Amen. Work through stuff. Look, look, look at verse 12. So that you may not be sluggish. I love that word in the Greek. It means uh, dull. Lazy, slow, oh, you'll do it, you just slow it getting to it, amen. Oh, God. He's watching. He, look, 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 so that you may not be sluggish. Look, look at verse 12, watch this. But imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. 
because the best is yet to come, God is looking, God is watching out for those that are willing to follow and mimic godly leaders. Now, the writer of Hebrews was so, so, uh, so, so right. He, he's, he's done a great job of encouraging people in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. What he does in the end of this chapter is he brings an example before us. He brings the example of Abraham. Y'all know Abraham's story, don't you? God called him, told him to leave his land, his people, his stuff, and go to a place that he knew not of. Now, guess what? I, 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 ain't, going, I, ain't, going to, I ain't going to Kentucky without an address <laughs> that I could program into ways. Come on, somebody. Abraham had to go with no directions. God made a promise to him that he was going to give him a land and a legacy. The land that they call Palestine now is the land of Israel. Even in our Bibles, it's, 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 it's put wrong. On the maps in the back of the Bible that always has the, the land of Palestine. It's not the land of Palestine. It's the land of Israel. Far as he could see. Then, then he was given a legacy. God told him one time to, to look up at the sky. He would have more offering. His, his, his legacy, watch this, would would be, would be more than all the stars in the sky. Then another time, Abraham was walking in the sand dunes, amen. God told him, your legacy is going to be like the sand. Can't count it. But then not only would, out of that legacy would come one seed, it would be the savior of all people. The only problem is it took 25 years for the promise to come. Now, I need you to see this clearly. That, that your future is based, watch this, on the reliability of God, not on what you can do. Watch this. God is so great. God is so reliable that he made a covenant with Abraham. And because there was nobody greater than him, verse 13 says, he made a covenant with himself. I mean, what's he going to do? Ask me to shake on it? You know <laughs> Nobody greater than God. That's why the Bible says that his ways are past finding out. His ways are not our ways. Isaiah says nobody can make him more wise. Nobody can be God's counselor. Nobody can give God knowledge. Verse 13, verse 13 says he swears by himself. He said in verse 14, surely I will bless you. I'm going to bless you. Surely I'm going to bless you. No doubt about it. Then verse 13, 15 says, Abraham waited what? Patiently. <laughs> Anybody here know that God makes you wait? Anybody here found out God is slow? He's slow. He's slow. Did 
Dr. Charles Stanley says there's one thing worse than waiting on God, and that is wishing that you had waited on God. Is there a crowd of people that have wished you had waited on God? You, you never would have done that, amen. Never would have made that decision. Never would have married her. Never would have married him, amen. Never would have took that job. Never would, no, 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 you, you but you, you just had, couldn't wait any longer. Abraham, Abraham, Abraham waited. Abraham waited and then he what? Obtained what? The promise. He obtained the promise. Now, now look, verse 16 is interesting. He's saying, you know what, generally verse 16, look, for people swear by something greater than themselves and in all their disputes and oath is final confirmation. Here it is. We say, you said it. Or, or you've been in contract with somebody. You, you bring the contract. Amen. The contract is what? Legal and binding, even in the court of law. That's what we do. But God, and we do it because we fail. That's, that's really we do it because we can't be trusted. We make oaths, amen, and we get contracts because we might say we're going to do it and don't do it. But God has never been that way. He has never failed. He, he has done nothing but what he has said. Yet, because he wants us to know for ourselves. Well, look, look, look. It, he says it better himself. Look at verse 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his person, he guaranteed it with an oath. So there are two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We have, look at this, fled for the refuge, might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is what set before us. We have a we have a future because God is reliable. God is trustworthy. Amen. You, 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 you were you were exactly right, Pastor Pastor Truitt. In those in those finance, Pastor Pruitt, you were you were you were exactly right in those finance meetings when when the income was low and the outgo was high, to stand on what God has said. Because he's reliable. Is there anybody here that you've done that in your own life? Amen. The only hope you had is what God had said. Yeah. God promised it. God's reliable. He makes ways out of no ways and opens the doors that no man can open and closes doors that no man can close. Well, there's another reason why you have a future. You have a future because you have an anchor. We have an anchor. We have an anchor. Look at verse 19. For we have, underline that, Paul does not say you have, but we have. Every believer possesses this anchor. You know what an anchor does? It holds a ship in place. It makes sure the ship won't drift away. We all, we all have we all, we all, we all possess a hope, amen, that, that, that will, will, will keep us from drifting away. That's why salvation cannot be lost. That's why we believe in the doctrine of eternal security, the, the doctrine of perseverance of the saints, because we all have a hope, amen, that keeps us in the promises of God, that keeps us where we're supposed to be. Am I making sense? We have, look at this, this is as this as a underline this word a sure and steadfast. This anchor that we have that that word sure means that it's indestructible by anything on the outside. Amen. This anchor cannot be destroyed. 
No power can destroy this anchor that we all have. We, we sing that song, my soul has been anchored. You're exactly right. And this anchor that you have is eternal, indestructible. It's an indestructible power. Not only that, but it's steadfast. It's both sure and what? Steadfast. Sure speaks of what it is. Indestructible. Steadfast speaks of where it's placed. Oh, you missed it. You missed it. Only, only, if you ever seen these big ships, only, only the captain can say drop anchor. And, 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 and the anchor may be sure, but if it's not put in the right place, amen, it won't hold the ship. Watch the text. The text says that, that we have this anchor that is sure, indestructible, and steadfast. It's an anchor of the soul. It's steadfast because of where this anchor is. Look at where it is. Behind what? The curtain. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We, we, we have a hope because we have an anchor. We have an anchor. We have all of us. We have Phillips. You got it. Mount Enon, you have it. We have this anchor that is sure cannot be destroyed. Nothing can break it apart. Nothing can destroy it. But not only is it sure, but it's steadfast. That means it's in the right place. And the right place, the text says, is behind the veil. Uh-oh. It's trying to tell us who this, this anchor is. Short list. Only Christ is behind the veil. Oh, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock. I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. We, we have an anchor. We all possess it. You may not know it, but you know it. But, but I'm, I'm sure of it, amen. We, we have an anchor that is sure. Cannot be destroyed. No power can crush it. This anchor is placed in the right place. Behind the anchor, behind the, the veil, is Jesus? It's, it just comes out, comes out very, very sure. Look, look at, look at verse, look at verse 19. We have, this is a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope entered into the place behind the curtain. Look at this, verse 20, where who has gone? Where Jesus has gone. I love this. On our behalf. That's why you got a future. That's why you got a, a hope. Because where he is now, one day you and I will be. He's just gotten there ahead of us. He's our forerunner. Look at this. He's our high priest. In the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek had no beginning. He had no ending. Didn't he just appeared on the scene? He's in the order. Didn't say he was Melchizedek. He's in the order of Melchizedek. That, that's really the most important verses of this text. The fact that we have an anchor that's sure. We have an anchor that's steadfast. Placed in the right place behind the veil, behind the curtain. Who is what? Jesus. Our high priest. Well, you're not feeling me. I, I, I had, as a good friend, a, a captain in the Navy. He's passed now, Captain, captain Riley. He, he was a decorated naval officer. He went in 
to the Navy after going to Annapolis. And during the Vietnam War, he flew jets off of aircraft carriers. Then he was able, he was in, in his career, 30 years, he spent 20 years on the sea. Only 10 years on the land. He was, he was able, he was able, he was able to be the captain of some of the greatest warships in the US, in the naval arsenal. He was a great friend. He said, he said something one, one, one time. He said, Jimmy, he said, I, I always felt more comfortable in a storm. That, that's what he said to me. He said, I always felt more, most comfortable in a storm. He said, oh, yes. I said, really? He said, yeah, I, I felt most, most comfortable in the storm. He said, matter of fact, when, when we would be at anchor and a major storm would come, we would, we would send out a call and call all, all of our troops back on the, on the, on the ship. And, and though the storm was coming, we would not stay anchored at the land. We would go out sometimes into the middle of the storm. I said, what would you do? We would get in the middle and we would, we would drop anchor. I said, why would you drop anchor? Because listen, he said, we would drop anchor in the middle of the storm because the anchor would, would be able to hold us. But then he said something amazing. He said, I've, I've, been, I've, been, on, I've been on battleships. Sometimes the whole front end would be submerged underwater. Then the, then, then the same wave would take us back up again back and forth, up and down, all night long. But we were safer in the storm than we were in the shore. He said, because not only was the anchor sure and steadfast, but the ship was storm worthy. And, I, and I've got good news for you today, church. It doesn't matter what kind of future we move into. It doesn't matter... What, what kind of uh, things we face in our world? What kind of storms? I'm here to tell you, we have an anchor. And we're on a ship that is storm worthy. Father, we bless you today and praise you for your goodness and for your mercy, for your grace. Lord, you love Mount Enon. That's the only explanation for these 94 years. And because of that, we are sure of better things to come. You, oh God, not only love this church, According to scripture, that cannot lie, you have not forget, forgotten their labor of love. We are now at the part where we're going to have candles lit in memory of Pastor John F. Cunningham, his vi vision to build this family life center, and it is to whom it was named. Um, that candle is going to be lit by Michael B. Cunningham. You would welcome him today. Oh. Amen. Bootleg preacher. <laughs> Jack Leg. Past members who have contributed and passed on. These are not all the names, but these are some of the ones that we could remember right off the top of our heads. Uh, so many people who have gone on that did not get the opportunity to see. That worked so diligently with us. Sold so faithfully. And... Uh, that candle today is going to be lit by um, Timothy A. Cunningham.
Come on, give it up. And for the present contributors, Mount Enon Missionary Baptist Church members and friends who have paid off the John F. Cunningham Family Life Center, Pastor Corey Cunningham is going to come and light that candle. All the candles are lit now. If you would, please, saints of God, I'm not going to ask you to stand. Go to the very back of your program, if you would, please. Well, if y'all want to stand, it's okay. Come on, stand with us, if you will, then. Those of you who feel like it. Dear friends, now that we have completed building and paid all indebtedness on it, let us dedicate this building and rejoice in its holy use. To the glory of God who has called us by grace. To the honor of Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. To the praise of the Holy Spirit who illumines, I'm sorry. What's that word? Did I say it right? And sanctifies us. What's your response? For the worship of God in prayer and praise, for the preaching of the everlasting gospel, for the celebration of the holy sacraments. What's your response? For the comfort of all who mourn, for the strength of those who are tempted, for light to those who seek the way. For the hallowing of family life, for the teaching and guiding the young, for the perfecting of the saints. For the conversion of sinners. For the promotion of righteousness. For the extension of God's reign. In the unity of the faith. In the bond of brotherhood and sisterhood. In love and goodwill to all. In gratitude for laborers. For the laborers. Of all uh, who love and serve this church. In loving, loving remembrance of those who have finished their course in hope of the eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In celebration in honor of the uh, payoff of the Mount Eden Missionary Baptist Church's uh, John F. Cunningham Life Center, uh, those who come in there get the opportunity to send theirs up as well. <laughs> but we do this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's do this release in Jesus' name. Ready? Ready. Let it go. Yeah. All right. Put your hands together. Come on. 